or so. Um, welcome back to your second and final education session for the Maximising Cancer Screening Project through Primary Care. Uh, just a quick introduction from myself in case you don't remember me from last time. My name is Laura. I'm from Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Network and I will be moderating this session. So just a bit of housekeeping. Um, like last time, this session will be recorded. Um, since we are such a small group, if you feel comfortable to, feel free to turn your camera on. Um, otherwise, please ensure both your camera and microphone are turned off. Um, if you have any questions throughout, please pop them into the chat box and we'll come back to it at the end during the Q&A or um, if we have time throughout the presentations. If you are having any technical difficulties, please feel free to send me a message through the chat function. Um, you can do this by going to the chat box, selecting the drop down, and then uh, selecting my name. I uh, will be sending a post session survey uh, during the Q&A, as well as via email after today. So similar to the email that you would have received um, today from last sessions. Um, you do need to fill out this post uh, uh, session evaluation. And similar to last time, slides will be made available to you. Uh, so that's all from me. So I will pass it over to yourself, Jenny. Thank you. Sorry, everyone. Just be one minute. I'm very sorry. Here we go. Okay. Well, hello, sorry about that. There's always a little bit of technical issues with these things. Hello and welcome to the Cancer Council Victoria's Practice Level Support Webinar, which is to do with your objective of increasing the proportion of screening for those patients with hep hepatitis B or hepatitis C risk factors, which is for liver cancer screening. As you may remember from last week, my name is Jenny Jones and I'm the Primary Care Engagement Coordinator at Cancer Council Victoria. I'd also like to um, introduce my colleague, Gabrielle Bennett, who is the clinical nurse consultant and Victoria hepatitis, viral hepatitis educator at St Vincent's Hospital, Melbourne. Thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting from today and pay my respects to elders past and present and those emerging. I extend my respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. I'd also like to thank all our partners for this project. Okay, so as Laura mentioned, this session builds on the clinical group education sessions which were delivered by VCS Foundation and key partners that covered bowel, breast, cervical and viral hepatitis, which can cause liver cancer and the education around the importance of asking the question and cultural safety. Today, this session um, provides practical information to support you in achieving the learning outcomes and to commence developing and implementing cancer screening activities to meet your set target to increase the proportion of screening for those patients with hepatitis B or hepatitis C risk factors. So your learning um, outcomes uh, um, to describe the enablers for creating a culturally safe and inclusive environment 
and to support an increase in hepatitis B and hepatitis C screening. Describe the effective strategies to increase hepatitis B and hepatitis, screen, hepatitis C screening and define the roles and responsibilities of your general practice team to achieve a whole of practice approach to increasing screening of patients with hepatitis B and hepatitis C risk factors. And lastly, to identify where you can access evidence-based information, resources, and further training to support your practice to increase screening of patients with hepatitis B and hepatitis C risk factors. So the session will be broken into four parts with each part aligning to the learning outcomes. Now, before we begin, we're just going to do a quick poll, which Laura will put up. And we're going to be start by asking, how many of you are currently screening patients with risk factors for hepatitis B or hepatitis C? Okay, let's have a look at the result. Okay, so yes, we have, oh, 83% are already um, doing screening. Um, so that's great. That's a really good, um, good to know. Okay. So just to, just to remind you that most liver cancer is preventable. So like there's primary prevention, which is vaccinations to prevent hepatitis B here and overseas, harm reduction to prevent hepatitis C infection, then your secondary prevention, prevention, which is diagnose and treat patients with chronic hepatitis B with antiviral therapy and diagnose and cure people with chronic hepatitis C before they get cirrhosis. And all of these um, will help with um, the mortality from liver cancer, which can be reduced with these strategies. So I'll now um, hand you over to Gabrielle for the next session. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I'd like to start by also acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we meet on tonight and to pay my respects to elders past and present. And I guess to put that into some context, we know that Aboriginal people will experience hepatitis C and B at far higher rates than the non-Indigenous community. Thank you, next slide. So um, just a little bit of a recap. Uh, you covered cultural safety in the session last week by Victorian Cytology Service. Tonight, we're going to just do a more specific session about how to create culturally safe practice um, when you're working with people who live with Hep B and Hep C. So again, just a bit of a recap from last week. Uh, we have about 230,000 people living with chronic Hep B in Australia. Two out of five are not diagnosed. Um, so that's, you know, a huge proportion of people actually need testing and diagnosing and educating. Um, the most people, the, the screening uh, risk factors are quite numerous, um, but if you screen, screen people, offer screening to people that were born in endemic areas overseas in high prevalence countries and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, you will actually cover probably about two thirds of the people here living with Hep B. Um, with hepatitis C, we've treated and cured about 35% of people in the last five years, which is fantastic progress with these new treatments. However, we still have over 60% of people living with hep C that we need to get cured and prevent liver cancer. Um, there's quite a number of barriers and enablers for people living with Hep C and Hep B to access care. So we're going to go over those um, this evening. So we'll look at some of these barriers because the more you can understand them, the more uh, your service is going to be invited, inviting to these clients and the more people you're actually going to be able to cure. Thank you. 
So starting with cultural safety and inclusion, uh, a lot of people think culture is just about ethnicity. It's about a lot more than ethnicity. It's about a lot more than just where you were born and what language you speak. It's also about the food you eat, the dress you wear, our communication styles can be very different. There's many influences. It's also about how we see ourselves and where we feel we belong. Um, it impacts a lot on our daily interactions at work and at home. And I guess these sorts of influences are often operating at a subconscious level. We don't often recognise um, that you know, these, these influences on the way we operate, we often don't recognise it until we're in another culture or in another country. And then we sort of start to understand that we've normalised our own cultural influences. Thank you. So culture really influences our health beliefs and our behaviour. It influences um, our communication style, the way we share information, the way we receive it, um, all the steps that a person would go through getting screened for hep C and hep B. Um, they're gonna be influenced the whole way along by their culture. So, um, for instance, I, I know I can think of a young man who we diagnosed with hepatitis B. He was from, he was born in an African country and he'd come to Australia as a young teenager. And he was now in his early 20s and we diagnosed him with hep B. Because his grandmother had died of hepatitis B and liver cancer, he immediately thought that he was going to die quite soon. So you can see how his experience um, really influenced how he received that information. Culture can really influence how clients access support and healthcare as well. A lot of people um, have felt uncomfortable in healthcare services. Um, some of the refugee clients I used to work with had actually been tortured in uh, health services, hospitals or dentists. Uh, so they were very reluctant to access any healthcare. Thank you. This pie graph is showing the breakdown of people living with chronic hepatitis B in Australia. And you can see that nearly about two thirds of people were born in endemic areas overseas in Northeast and Southeast Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa or their Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So their experiences in health, illness, health systems um, is really going to influence how they engage in their care. Thank you. I'm going to show now a very short video. It only goes for about three minutes. And this is the story of Alan. Alan is telling his own story about living with hepatitis B. Now it is filmed in the USA, but I think many of the issues that Alan brings up are really very, very similar here. Thank you. When I listened to my son sing, I just wrapped myself around that moment. Somehow it takes me back to all the memories, the beautiful experiences my uncles and so many others never had, simply because they didn't know. Uncle Peter passed away in his mid-50s, then Uncle Luther a few years later, and it eventually caught up with my Uncle Henry in his 60s. My family only knew my uncles died from liver cancer because doctors never say a person dies from hepatitis B. So we didn't know what was killing us until around the time I met Jill, who became my wife. My liver became so badly inflamed that a doctor finally diagnosed me with the chronic form of the virus. It was only because I was an anchor and news reporter with a medical reporter friend who connected me to a leading hepatologist that I got the attention I needed. 
Only then was I asked about my family history and encouraged to talk to my family and begin treatment. Later we found out my older brother and sister had been rejected at the blood bank because they had Hep B. Then my mother and younger sister decided to get a blood test. They had it too. We were left to connect the dots because the medical profession is failing to address an epidemic that kills more than 700,000 people a year. It's bad enough that hepatitis B is a silent killer with few symptoms until it's too late. It's also ignored by Asian cultures that consider talk about deadly diseases to be taboo. Sometimes I wonder if hepatitis B is being ignored here in the U.S. just because it impacts so many Asians, especially given the country's history of discrimination toward immigrants. I think about that a lot. I also think about the millions of other people who could lose the same joy I have because they simply don't know they have the virus, and about how lucky I am that my early treatment gave my liver a chance to regenerate itself. We're not just trying to cure cancer, we're trying to prevent it before it happens. The biggest battle is against ignorance, amongst patients and doctors. We can do this. Just be proactive. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so you can see that even though Alan had good levels of education, uh, he really did struggle with low health literacy and with understanding the link between hepatitis B and liver cancer. Um, I think a lot of the time as health professionals, we might have diagnosed people, but we haven't actually explained to the clients what the situation is and what they need to do. So often our communication styles also let the clients down. Um, so how does culture and inclusion relate to hepatitis C? This is a quote from the Kirby Institute in Sydney. The criminalisation of drug use, social discrimination and stigma and lack of access to health services means that people who inject drugs are at high risk of acquiring HIV and hepatitis C. People with hepatitis C uh, experience health systems in a quite a different way, I think, to people with hepatitis B. Um, often they have experienced a lot of stigma. They've been treated um, quite badly sometimes, and so they can be really hesitant to access a health service. Obviously, their dependency and social situation can also um, create barriers to them accessing health services. Thank you. Often clients with hepatitis C will also see themselves as non-deserving. Um, clients have told me that because they're still injecting or they have very low self-esteem, they don't deserve to be cured. And we've got some very good research to show that stigma and discrimination is still alive and well in health services, unfortunately, around hep C. I think we've improved a lot, but there's a lot of areas that we can improve some more. So the challenges for cultural safety and inclusion for clients are uh, navigating a very complex health system and knowing where your referral's going to, where you have to go for particular tests. Um, language barriers can be also not just um, different ethnic languages, but also there's a culture of language, I guess, amongst a lot of people that use drugs, um, different jargon, and uh, sometimes people, you know, don't understand the medical clinical terms that we're referring to. Socioeconomic disadvantage um, and competing needs. A lot of clients I've worked with have, they've got a Centrelink appointment, that's gonna take priority over their health service appointment. If they're looking for housing at risk of homelessness, again, that's gonna take priority over health. 
Poor health literacy is a really large area that we need to be paying more attention to and um, there's a lot of work being done in that area. Thank you. So what are the challenges for cultural safety and inclusion for health services? We need to find ways around these barriers. I think we're probably quite familiar with a lot of these barriers, so I don't want to focus on them. Um, but I think it really is important that we have a, have a pause, look at how we're delivering our service and look at some ways we might be able to um, change that around and improve things. Thank you. So this is the principles of inclusive healthcare practice from the Department of Health and Human Services website. I think even though health professionals mean well and they really want to keep to these standards, um, it's not always an easy thing to do. Of course, we aim to protect people's dignity and identity and their well-being. But things get in the way. Time, I think, is a really um, big barrier for us. So looking at how we can manage our time better. How can we change the systems around so that we've got a little bit more time? Uh, and this is, this is true of, you know, starting right at the front desk um, with reception and admin staff, right through all the health workers. Thank you. So inclusive practice enablers um, includes making a self and welcoming environment. I think if you have a poster up with people that look like your clients, if you have a poster up that advertises, uh, people can ask for an interpreter. Um, you might have another information around a local needle syringe program. Immediately, these are signs as soon as people walk in that it's an inclusive environment and they can see themselves in it. Language and communication, really important. Um, look at your forms and your information and check that they're in plain language. Um, medical jargon is not helpful to most clients and we should really be pitching our language at about a grade six level. Drop the Jargon is a um, program where we try to encourage health workers to use plain language. That's not always easy to do because we use jargon with each other all the time and it really does take a conscious effort not to use that jargon. But there's all sorts of tools around to help you do that. The Teach Back Toolkit is, describes a method of talking to clients to check that what we think we have told them is actually what they have understood. And that's another great strategy you can use. Language Matters and the Power of Words are great resources that talk about um, the language that we sometimes label people with, particularly around drug use, this is, and how that can really alienate people and stigmatise them. We don't always know the words that are sort of more acceptable to the client group. So I think it's important to, um, you know, read into that and um, inform ourselves a little bit more. Thank you. So some more inclusive practice enablers. Uh, confidentiality is a huge issue. Uh, many clients have told me about, you know, their diagnosis is um, set out loud around the practice or the health service. That obviously makes them feel extremely uncomfortable. Um, alert stickers on the front of hard copy health records. Again, they can be publicly seen and uh, can make clients feel very shamed. Sometimes um, people need a supported referral. That might mean actually offering someone to use the telephone right then and there to make their appointment for the dentist or the physio. Uh, a lot of people might not have credit on their phones. Um, their phones get cut off. So support them to actually act on their health. Trauma-informed care we're hearing more and more about. 
Um, I think the range that trauma can create a whole range of different symptoms from headaches and fatigue to depression and nightmares. Um, and this can really create a very big barrier to people to access healthcare. So being aware of that, particularly if you know your clients have had trauma in their background. And I guess, you know, I would say that a lot of people living with Hep B and Hep C have. Thank you. So there's lots of tools to help you do all these things. I guess it's just sort of a matter of, of looking at your practice now and thinking what, what is it gonna, what, what's gonna be easy to improve on? This photo up in the corner is taken from Utopia Health Clinic, and this is a consult room. And you can see there's some, um, 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 a blanket on the chair and hanging up at bags. This is um, their cultural symbols to the clients that immediately make them feel, um, I think, a little bit more relaxed. They know that their culture is um, acceptable. There's a lot of resources on our website at St V's around plain language, and there's also videos too that have got dubbed in different languages to explain to people what hepatitis B is. There's tear off sheets you can use in the clinic to help emphasize your main messages to your clients. And there's a lot of tools and resources out there to help you. Thank you. So now I'll go on to the second learning outcome, which is about effective strategies to increase hepatitis B and C screening. So we've covered some practical ways um, that you can do that. Now um, we're going to look more at systems related strategies that you can undertake. And the PHN will assist you to follow through on a lot of these strategies. So there's four main areas that we need to think about um, identifying, four main groups of patients that we might think about following up. So patients at risk of Hep B and C who need a test, they're not even diagnosed yet. Patients who haven't been tested, um, uh, but are not yet on treatment or monitored. So we know that about um, two thirds of people with Hep B are not monitored regularly enough every six months. And we know that there's a lot of people around with Hep C that have been diagnosed, uh, but they haven't been able to follow up on treatment for a variety of reasons. The third group is patients who require a weak, we call it a sustained virological response test, which is 12 weeks after they have finished their treatment. This determines cure of the hep C treatment and a lot of people haven't had that 12 week test. The fourth group is patients who require ongoing care, even if they are cured of hepatitis C, if they have cirrhosis, they still need regular checkups and monitoring to prevent liver cancer. Thank you. Next one. So this is a... Um, um, part of the Eliminate Hep C partnership um, tool. There's a practice support tool um, that is full of wonderful tips for you to be able to do searches on your database and identify really quite easily which patients you might want to follow up on. This is a screenshot um, and the link to the practice support tool is down the bottom there. Thank you. So with hepatitis B, you can actually use some of the techniques described in the Hep C manual. Um, but for hepatitis C, you can also use PENCAS and PENCAT, and they're very good at helping you trawl through your database. And you might just put in a risk factor, for instance, of, um, you know, the country they were born in, an endemic country, and you'll get a whole list of clients coming up and then you can work out whether they need to be tested or recalled for their six monthly checkup. Thank you. 
Again, you can use um, PENCAS and PENCAT to um, do all sorts of searches. You can add filters like someone's age, you might um, pull out reports. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can use these and the Primary Health Network will um, assist you to do this and show you how to work these systems uh, to make it easier for you. Thank you. Recall and reminder systems are really important. Um, now that we have a cure for hepatitis C, um, it's really important to remind people that we now have treatments that can cure them. Uh, they're very effective treatments and very few side effects. And a lot of people don't actually realize this yet. So um, we know research tells us that if a GP sends a letter or an SMS or a reminder, that often patients will really take notice of that. They're a trusted, you're a trusted source of information and it can really motivate people to follow up. Um, you can insert links and videos or translated resources into your letters and SMSs. You might mention that you can use, um, that, that you can book an interpreter for people. Um, it's important to be aware of changed addresses and phone numbers. And I guess ideally that's been checked as soon as someone arrives at the practice out at the front desk. Um, that's the way we lose a lot of people, I think. They change address and phone numbers. Um, very difficult to make contact with them. Thank you. This system, Go Share, um, I'm not familiar with it myself, but it's a PHA, it's, sorry, it's a platform that the Primary Health Network will give you a license to use for this project. Um, and it has bundles of tools and templates about hepatitis that you can use in SMSs or letters. So you might just pull out the bits that you want your letter or your message to your clients to say. Um, it's, you can use it in a targeted mail out. And again, the PHN will provide support for you to be able to use this system and to help you notify your clients. Thank you. Supporting opportunistic screening is really important. Um, you know, we have clients come in, not many people come in and say, I want a hep B check or I want a hep C check. So it's really um, important to, um, whenever someone presents for anything, think about, gee, I wonder if they're at risk for hep B or hep C at their routine health checks and, and offer them screening if they tick some of the boxes. You can add notes and flags um, on your um, record system to notify you that these clients are at risk. And um, it's also a really good time to provide clients with some education around hepatitis. Um, just a reminder that hepatitis C and hepatitis B are both notifiable diseases in Victoria. And that's another really important part of following up on their care. Thank you. Well, thanks for that, Gabrielle. I'm going to just um, do the next section. So the next um, learning outcome is about defining the roles and responsibilities of your general practice team to achieve a whole of practice approach to increasing screening of patients with hepatitis B and hepatitis C risk factors. So as we've talked about, um, there's the effective strategies to increase the proportion of screening for your patients for, uh, with hep B or hep C risk factors. We now need to talk about how to best to, to implement it across your practice. So an engaged and effective practice teams are the best foundation for meeting your targets. If you want to change the cancer screening outcomes in your practice, you need to have a whole of practice approach which includes GPs and practice manager, practice nurse, and all the non-medical staff as well. So the whole practice. So consider how your practice is currently operating. The whole of practice approach should address the patient, the practice, and the systematic 
barriers to hepatitis B and hepatitis C screening in, is in at-risk patients. It's important to nominate a ded dedicated staff member who will drive the change and have a designated sponsor who is responsible for the change and ensure that everyone has clear understanding of the roles and responsibilities. So it's that change management sort of approach. Firstly, develop a clear plan which all the practice staff have had input into. It is important to have policies and procedures in place for cancer screening and have regular meetings to discuss the key actions and track your pro progress. So questions that you should think about is like, do all members of your team know their roles and responsibilities about meeting targets for this project? Do you display cancer screening material, including information about hepatitis around the practice? And are there visual clues to demonstrate your practice is culturally safe place? And Gabrielle talked about a few of those um, before. Um, are all staff trained about how to ask the question around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples and um, cold identification status? status? And is this recorded? It's not just asking the question, but are, then are you recording um, this information across practice forms? People are um, often not comfortable about asking the question or about being asked. So it's important for practice staff to be clear as to why they are asking. And to be matter of fact, stating it is just part of general demographic data collection. And we watched an excellent video um, about this um, during the VCS um, in, in, um, webinar last week. And I've also added this video to the um, reference list at the, at the back of the, of the end of the pro, um, webinar. Now, we're just going to do another little quick um, quiz. Laura can add up for me. Just so before, I, before we begin this, I just want to just say that we are aware that with this quiz that everyone, every practice is different and that every practice has different models. For example, a practice might have a sole GP, it might have a, a practice, might have a practice manager and some practices don't have practice nurses. So please use this information adapted to what is appropriate for your practice. So I'll get Laura to put up the practice. Okay. So the first question is based on your role in your practice, how would you create a culturally safe and inclusive practice? So there is more than one answer can be correct. Ooh, okay, all of the above. Great. Oops, sorry. And having a little trouble with my mouse. And poll. Share results. So we've got 88% saying all of the above. Um, 38% saying offer interpreters at appointments. Um, we have 25% saying use private pathology forms in, when using them. Ensure that you record Aboriginal and cold identification. And we have 25% saying understand your community and develop partnerships with key priority communities. And we have 25% saying by education, explain the tests and the screening um, and provide patient instructions in other languages. And we have 50% display brochures and flyers and um, posters. So just a few other little things that I could maybe mention, including with that would be, um, and I think Gabrielle mentioned it before, but also you could be displaying Aboriginal flags or artwork in your practice. It's a nice culturally um, a, a good way of making people feel welcome. Um, also, um, use inclusive language, which Gabrielle also talked about. Um, and we talked about following up patients who do not attend appointments and addressing potential barriers to um, why the patient didn't attend. 
Um, and other things we could also is um, we did mention offering um, offering an interpreter, which we have there. So the next one, we'll stop that one. And get Laura to put the next question up. Okay, based on your role in the practice, how would you include opportunistic screening into your role to increase screening for those patients with hepatitis B or hepatitis C risk factors? Okay. So that's correct, all of the above. So, um, we have promote the screening program within your practice, respond to recalls and reminders and engage in opportunity discussions and support patients to participate in screening by addressing potential barriers to screening. So that was all correct. Now the next couple of slides, a, 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 I'll just end that. So the next couple of slides are some tables just outlining um, what we've just talked about. And you'll be given the slides after the presentation tomorrow, the, um, Laura will send them out to you. So you can have another thorough look through them, but they're basically just talking about the roles of each person in your practice. As I said, whether your practice has, um, has a, just a GP or um, you can adjust it to, to your exact practice. Okay, so I'll hand you back to Gabrielle now just to talk about um, a few evidence-based, some evidence-based information. Thanks, Jenny. Um, that was really interesting seeing how people um, ticked which box, you know, about what, what strategies they can use. I came across a practice nurse and um, every client over the week, no matter if she was seeing them for a vaccination or wound care, whatever she was seeing them for, she'd just simply say, we're letting everybody know this week that we have new hepatitis C treatments that can cure. As simple as that. Mm -hmm. um, some people would just ignore it and move on. Some people would show interest and ask more questions. Um, so I don't think it was a it was a hard thing. It didn't take her a lot of extra time, but I thought it was a really effective strategy to start getting the message out there. So moving on to learning outcome number four. Um, which is really just putting you in touch with a whole lot of evidence-based websites and information that are all designed to help you improve your practice regarding screening. So the Eliminate Hepatitis C Partnership Practice Support Toolkit, I mentioned this before, it's a fantastic resource. The link is down the bottom there. It has got different sections on maximising your billing processes. Um, it's about how to identify patients, how to do audits, how to set up different processes so that you can send reminders. And many of these systems can actually be used for Hep B as well. So that's a great resource. It's also got posters that you can download and print and put up around your practice. So I really um, recommend that you have a look at that. Thank you, next one. So this is also regarding the Hepatitis C Practice Support practice support toolkit. Um, it recommends all sorts of shortcuts. It has templates, um, talks about data processing entry um, processes, and you can use it with medical, medical director, best practice or ZMED. Um, it also um, helps you partake in a plan, do, study, act sort of um, activity to reflect on your practice. And again, I, you know, you mightn't do everything that's in it, but, you know, pick out a couple of, um, couple of processes in this that interest you and it really will probably improve, um, improve your screening. Thank you. 
Most of you probably know Health Pathways. For those that don't, it's a free online resource for GPs and nurses out in primary care, and it's best practice clinical information about a whole range of illnesses. So you can just plug in whatever you're looking for. In this case, it would be chronic Hep B or Hepatitis C, and you will get a really nice succinct summary of what the risk factors are, what tests to order, how to interpret the tests, what the follow-up would be, what referral might be required. And you can click on the different links and it just takes you through the whole clinical journey really of the client. There's also links to information for clients in other languages and um, it's constantly been updated. So it's links to all sorts of other evidence-based websites. So it really is a fantastic tool. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to now just talk about the optimal care pathways. So within the health pathways that Gabrielle was talking about, there are these optimal care pathways which are documents and quick reference guides that described optimal care for various cancer diagnoses. So they're a great way for health professionals that don't work full-time in cancer care to check details of pathways and recommendations for patients with cancer. They can be loaded, located here on the Cancer Council Victorian website. So um, we have the link in the references down below. But so if you go onto the health um, professionals part and you can see um, the optimal care pathways have been rolled out gradually since 2014. Um, the full um, opti optimal care pathways are about 60 to 80 pages long and reasonably technical. Um, but there are two page quick reference guides for each of the um, optimal care pathways, which summarise the key points and are really handy. So for each optimal care pathway, um, it has information about prevention, detection, investigations, treatments, and um, more information. So that's a really handy tool as well. Also, Cancer Council Victoria manages the Cancer Screening Hub. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of it. This, we have um, an extensive range of supportive tools, templates, resources and posters in, in many different languages um, and translations, presentations and case studies to help you implement strategies to improve screening rates and deliver an inclusive, culturally safe service. Um, and here are just a few of the many examples that we have um, of the different brochures, fact sheet, engaging these, um, engaging hip hop videos delivered, delivered by the community. So there's a whole range of resources there um, for you. Hand you back to Gabrielle. Thanks, Jenny. So look, there's a stack of learning and education out there to support you. I guess it's just a matter of picking what's going to be most relevant to you and what interests you. The Centre for Ethnicity, Culture and Health delivers all sorts of training on cultural safety and health literacy and engaging with affected communities. Um, the Victorian Viral Hepatitis Educator, that's, that's my role. It's funded by the Department of Health and Human Services and um, it's funded to deliver education to health professionals. So I can tweak that to whatever you need in terms of um, content or timing. Um, so yeah, please make contact with me. The hepatitis C guidelines are the Australian recommendations for the management of hep C. And again, it just points you in the direction and steps you through the um, clinical pathway. The Australasian Society for HIV, Viral Hepatitis and Sexual Health Medicine, ASHM as it's known, has got a lot of resources both for health professionals and patients. And I think you might have received links last week to their nice little summary sheets, decision-making in Hep C and Hep B. 
Thank you. So more resources, the Cancer Council hub up the top there, Jenny's spoken about that. Uh, this next one, I think a word's dropped off, it's meant to be harm reduction, Victoria. That is a organisation that's funded by the health department to give a voice to drug users in Victoria. They've got all sorts of great resources there and it's a good way uh, to start to improve your and increase your understanding of drug user um, um, issues and drug user cultures, I guess. Um, we've talked about the Eliminate Hep C partnership. There's some links there for St Vincent's Gastroenterology. Again, there's a lot of um, resources there to support your discussion with patients that you can use in a clinical setting um, in a whole lot of different languages as well. There's Liverwell. Um, and again, we've got the EC partnership again down the bottom there. Thank you. This is a great form. It's a remote consult form that GPs can use. They don't have to. When we first got the new treatments five years ago, a lot of GPs were using these forms. It's just an A4 back and front. It's just a matter of filling in um, some clinical details of your client and some test results and then sending it in. Uh, you can send it to the um, PHN, I think, or you can send it to any of your publicly funded liver clinics and they will have a look and more or less just support you to make the decision about the new treatment. A lot of GPs have just, just used this for the first five or six times and then they build their confidence and then they don't need it anymore. But that tool is still there and um, it's a great way just to sort of get someone, a consultant, to just double check, you know, where you're up to. Thank you. We talked about PENCAS and PENCAT. Here are the links and lots of great tools to help you do audits and go through your databases. More <laughs> further learning for you. The Removing Barriers is a great video that was made by Asham and that talks about the stigma and discrimination that's very well researched that does exist in health services regarding hepatitis C and there's a whole toolkit there to help you understand more what that's about and what you can do to remove the barriers. The Power of Words from the Australian Drug Foundation, again, helps you to use language that's not going to alienate your clients. There's best practice examples um, for working with non-binary communities. Um, Teach Back and Hepatitis B, that's a video to, it's an instructional video to explain how to use the Teach Back technique to check that what you think you've told your clients is actually the message that they have received. It's often very different. Um, again, there's the video on asking the question. So look, lots and lots of tools for you. Thank you, the next one. That's it. <laughs>